Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest rendition of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Outer space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. Now, on to the science fiction. Story number one, The Children of Lethe. Mr. Wu, is that you? Bector asked as he entered the darkened apartment. Yes, Mr. Bector, it's me. A voice from deeper in the darkness called. The windows of the apartment looked out over the vibrant city. Do you mind if I, um, uh, turn on the lights? Bector asked as he left tentacles stretched for the rocker switch. I'd rather you didn't, Mr. Wu replied. He had found a chair that mostly conformed to his shape and sat there looking over the city. Your world is very pretty at night, he said. Ah, yes, Bector replied. Thank you. Did the contract not close well? Becto slid further into the apartment and set down the bag he'd been carrying. Hmm. <clears throat> oh no, it closed fine, Mr. Wu said. Senator Chikar's no more. There was no collateral damage as specified. He was enchanted with the twinkling blue and purple lights outside the window. There were, he knew, at least a few other colors of lights further up in the ultraviolet that he couldn't see. For a moment, the thought made him sad. Then the feeling drifted away like a puffy white seeds of a dandelion in a summer breeze. I'm sure the client will be pleased, Becto said. Mr. Wu had almost forgot he was there. I've lined up another eight high-profile jobs. Your reputation is netting us both well above market rates. After Turnin's board, Director Henchu, Mr. Eckler, and now the good senator, you become the hottest rising star in the industry. That's good, Mr. Wu said. Do you think these high-profile targets will have better security? I would... Uh, I don't know, Vector said. That's really more your end of the business. I suppose so, Mr. Wu said. They would almost certainly have improved security if they knew they'd be contracted. Most of them are either too naive or don't suspect termination, or they're too arrogant to think their security isn't up to the task. I don't think I can do much about the arrogance. That's, um... Good? Oh, it has nothing to do with that, Mr. Wu said. He whipped his head around and faced Bector for the first time since the conversation had started. You are still sending 80% of my fee to Earth account I gave you, right? Bector had never been a pious or religious person. He was an atheist from a long line of agnostics. He believed in what he could see and touch and feel. The material world was all that ever was or will be. But looking into Mr. Wu's eyes in the dim glow of the city lights, Bector felt his soul chum and felt his immortal essence being judged and found lacking. Those were the eyes that can consign an entire species to extinction and still find it to be their own fault for not being stronger. Uh, of c course, Mr. Wu, Bector stammered. Immediately upon receipt of the client for funds, I, I sent 80% exact Earth account you specified, and the remaining 20% into a local account. After taking my 10% fee at first, of course. Good, Mr. Wu said. I'd hate to have to do one final contract gratis. He turned back to the city lights, twinkling in the dark blanket of night. Well, I cannot cure the arrogant. I can educate the naive. I want you to set up a number of shell companies across multiple planets and jurisdictions. Make the trail hard to follow. Then the company at the end will make public who my next target is. What? Mr. Wu turned his cold, empty eyes back to Becto. Make my targets public. Y yes, sir, Becto said. C can um, I, may I, um... Why? Why would I want to warn my targets I'll be coming for them? Bector could not but nod in affirmative. Mr. Bector, when I came to you two years ago looking for work, I did not expect to live past the first contract, Mr. Wu said. But I did. Then I thought my luck surely would not carry me through a second contract. Alas, I lived. Contract after contract. I kept succeeding. These targets you send me after are weak. Arrogant, naive, and stupid. 
Vector took a step back without meaning to. I've asked for the most difficult jobs that you can find, Mr. Wu said. Still, I live. Are, um, are you looking to die? Yes, Mr. Wu said. Unfortunately, I find I cannot complete the task myself. I, uh, I'm not strong enough. I have a character defect that abhors waste. I cannot stand inefficiencies. Two birds with one stone is a good start, but an entire flock with one boulder is better. So, that brings me here. And yet I find you cannot provide the challenge I seek. So, make my next target public. The shell companies are for your protection, not mine. Though, if I lose you, I'll have to find another broker that will take time, and it'll be inefficient. Do your people not have someone who can help you? Assisted suicide is still suicide, Mr. Wu said. No, uh, I mean a doctor or a healer of some kind, Victor said. What will they tell me? That it'll get better. To count my blessings or maybe one of a thousand other empty platitudes. I am who I am. This world is not meant for me nor I for it, Mr. Wu said. I don't know what the healers may say, Vector said. Surely it's worth discussing it, though. You cannot give up so quickly. This, uh, this is not right. Just give me a contract, Mr. Wu said. Make sure you publish the details as soon as possible. Mr. Wu, this is not the way, Vector said. Even from an only pragmatic standpoint, you're the best asset I've seen in decades. But I cannot personally stand the thought of you... In a flash, Mr. Wu was up and out of the chair and in Bacto's face. Do not resume, Bacto. Without seeing how it got there, Bacto felt a cold edge of a knife pressed against the midsection. Mr. Wu, Bacto said, fighting to keep his voice calm. I apologize for overstepping. He was suddenly hyper-aware of every movement and position of his body, making double sure that nothing could be misinterpreted as sudden or hostile. Mr. Wu held Bekdo's eyes for a long moment before stepping back and sheathing his knife. Where is the contract? I shall have the details sent to you, Bekdo said. It'll take time to set up the shell companies and arrange for a secure publication of the contract's details. Other than the target's name, is there any other information you'd like to be made public? No, uh, Mr. Wu said. Do not divulge the amount, nor the client. Tell the universe that the child of Lethe seeks its next visitor. End of story. Story number two. Delivery service written by Lostful. Altric couldn't help but shake his head as he bounded towards his shuttle. Beside him was his partner, Sure. His clear scales refracting the sunlight each ray breaking into different wavelengths. The bulbous scales each appeared to glow in a different color of the spectrum. They had just made a delivery to a human colony. There are some freaky little creatures, aren't they? Shah whispered as they boarded the ship. Altrek glared at his partner. He was folding his ears down under his headrest. It had been a profitable stop, but one that he would never forget. I've never been insulted so thoroughly, yet treated as kindly as they just did. What in the hell just happened? He sighed in frustration, running a hand through his brown hair. Altric felt the temper rising again as he called for clearance to undock. He could hear the human controllers laughing as they cleared him. I think we missed something when we took the missions. Are we sure this was the right station? Sure, hissed, as he looked down their cargo vessel's bridge window. Never could see anything out of it, but it felt better than staring at a wall. Given the human reputation, I'm not so sure. They looked like the images of humans I've been shown, but uh, weren't violent or even intimidating. I must have had to sit for imaging with almost a thousand of their younglings, Altric reflected on the hours after they had docked. He remembered his confusion and apprehension and started once they opened the comms to the human station. That the first human had looked at them for a moment, looking at their cargo manifest again, and then bursting out laughing. 
He was still crying from laughing so hard as he told them where to dock. They had exited the shuttle to oversee the unloading of their cargo to find a welcoming committee waiting for them. The leader of the group had insisted, Your arrival was unexpected, but I can't say enough how thrilled we are to have you. Don't worry about your cargo, we'll take care of that, and extra for your trouble. They had thought that they were going to see the station master, but instead soon found themselves in the middle of a large park with the crowd staring at them. They were obviously in the middle of celebrating something. Aldrich and Schur had immediately known that they had disrupted it all by the stairs. At first, all Aldrich could think of was every horror story he had heard about humans. But rather than being upset, they dragged him into the middle of the festivities. It had taken hours to escape from that madness. I'm pretty sure I lost several scales to those little thieves. Sure, hissed, ripping Altric from his reflection. Sure, was reflecting on a few bare spots on his back. Altric chuckled. It had been entertaining to watch Sure trying to hide on the human station from the army of younglings. The younglings had been far more frightening than the adults. Let's call Noodle and see if he knows what happened, Altric mentioned as he reached for the communications unit. As the communicator connected, they saw the image of their feathered friend. Nogal's race was an avian, but fat with large tail feathers. He had several encounters with the humans and seemed obsessed with their holidays. He saw some parts of the year that he would never visit a human colony. Altric suspected they must have just experienced why. Boggle, boggle, boggle! Noggle started his racist customary greeting. How are you, Altric? And sure. We, well... We just had a strange encounter with a human station, Altric started. The younglings chased me while the adults pointed and laughed, and they make Altric sit there with the younglings and have images taken. Sher interrupted. Noggle's turtle was telling, looking at them. You two just visited a human colony during this time of year. Do you have any idea what part of the year it is for the humans? Uh, no... We haven't dealt with humans much. Why would they call me Hoppy and Thumper too? Altric replied, realizing that this was avoidable. Did the human company hire you to go in? Noggle immediately asked while openly laughing at something that he'd failed to explain yet again. Yeah. Both Altric and Sher replied, looking from Noggle to each other. The realization that the human from Cadbury had thought that they were perfect for this job for more reasons than the cargo shuttle. It's Easter, boys, and you look to the human children like a giant Easter bunny and a bunch of bunny eggs, Noggle said, laughing, while he changed the display to show the bunny and Easter eggs. The small mammal doesn't lay eggs, and why are the eggs so brightly painted? Aldrich muttered after looking at the images and data scrolling underneath. They are humans. Who knows? But look on the right side. My first visit to the humans was when Tyson hired me to deliver a load of goods to the station for Thanksgiving. Ever seen a human turkey? Noggle said with a suppressing a shudder. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.